everyone, let's dive right into the updates from the Bakhmut direction. Uh, late yesterday evening, it was confirmed that the town of Kleshivka was completely liberated by the forces of the 80th Separate Airborne Assault Brigade. However, the enemy continues to make relentless efforts to inflict maximum harm on our troops employing various means of firepower. Uh, this was to be expected and there were no changes uh, for the Russians to hold their defense there any longer. The Ukrainian armed forces counteroffensive is ongoing with an overall advance in this direction of another 700 meters within a day. Today the only question remaining is the area near Klyshivka, which is still in a gray zone. The Kurdyumivka area sees periodic advancements by the Ukrainian forces toward the outskirts of the village, but full liberation hasn't yet been achieved. Additionally, today President of Ukraine Volodymyr Zelensky commented on the coordination and operational actions of our units. I wish you health, fellow Ukrainians. I would like to express gratitude today to everyone who defends the sky of our country. Our pilots and engineers of the Air Force, warriors of mobile fire groups, all our anti-aircraft gunners. Thank you for constantly increasing the number of downed Russian missiles and drones, and thus the number of our people and infrastructure saved. Thank you, warriors. And to everyone who is now on the front line, to every brigade, from Kupyansk to the left bank of Kherson region, from the Bakhmut sector to every Ukrainian position on the front line in the south of our country. I thank you guys for your might. And today, I would like to especially recognize the warriors who are gradually regaining Ukraine's territory in the area of Bakhmut. The 80th Air Assault Brigade, the 5th Separate Assault Brigade, the glorious 95th and Fury Joint Assault Brigade of the National Police. Klishchivka, well done. Today, Ukraine marks Rescuers Day. And on Friday, I had the honor to personally thank the employees of the State Emergency Service of Ukraine and all those whose hearts simply feel that it is impossible otherwise, that we must take care of others, that we must help others when lives depend on it. Today, I want to thank not only all our rescuers, but also all the relatives, mothers and fathers of boys and girls, men and women working in the State Emergency Service of Ukraine. I thank you for raising your children this way, to save others, to make our entire society stronger and more humane. Thank you. Today, and this is a very symbolic coincidence, our country also marks Adoption Day. This is probably one of the most honorable missions in life, to help a child avoid an orphan's fate. I thank everyone who helps children in this way, everyone who spreads the warmth of their families so that there are fewer lonely destinies in this world. As a state, we must reach a point when all children in our country, all those who have been left without parental care, have their own family, their own home, their own family. Ukraine certainly must not be associated with orphanages. I thank everyone who works for this. Glory to everyone who helps our people and the entire country become stronger. And we are preparing new defense decisions for Ukraine. Air defense and artillery are a priority. Glory to Ukraine! Before we continue, I'd like you to share this video on social media and watch it through to the end. It greatly supports the growth of my channel. Thank you. Meanwhile, in the Avdiivka direction, the occupiers are attempting to dislodge the Ukrainian forces from the outskirts of Opetne, resulting in ongoing shelling. Additionally, they are advancing towards Vodyane, towards Severne, to regain lost positions. However, there have been no successes in the past day, and the front line remains unchanged. To the south in Marinka, battles continue for control of the city's outskirts. But the Ukrainian forces are successfully holding their defense and the front line remains unchanged as well. In the Vuhledar direction, Russian attacks towards Novodarivka are ongoing. 
It's evident that the occupiers are making significant advances, approximately 7 kilometers beyond the farthest front line. This indicates that they currently have the upper hand in the gray zone and are attempting to push into territory previously held by Ukrainian forces, aiming to reclaim lost positions and prevent further Ukrainian advancements. However, Ukrainian forces haven't yet initiated a counteroffensive in this area, resulting in relatively low overall activity. In the Zaporizhia direction, Ukrainian forces are gradually advancing. There haven't been any recent successes reported near Verbove and Novoprokopivka, but there is progress in the Robotin area, advancing approximately one kilometer. Despite the deployment of additional Russian reserves and attempts to launch attacks from the flanks, Ukrainian forces continue to maintain the initiative and push the front line in their favor. It's becoming increasingly difficult for the Russians to hold their defense in this region, and a breakthrough by Ukrainian forces is expected sooner or later. Uh, however, it's uh, challenging to predict the exact timing of this breakthrough due to the changing situation and potential surprises from the enemy. Notably, the enemy has increased the use of FPV drones, adding complexity to the Ukrainian forces' advancements. In the Kherson direction, there are no new changes along the front line and the occupiers continue shelling across the entire front. Additionally, there was an attack from the Kinbur Speed towards Ochakiv yesterday. The situation remains complex, and satellite images of the Kohovka Reservoir have been circulating online, showing rapid overgrowth in the area. However, a small river appears to still exist, making it difficult for troops to advance through this terrain. In Crimea, for example, aside from active air defense operations, late in the evening yesterday, uh, reports uh, emerged of significant explosions in Sevastopol. Detailed information is currently unavailable, but it appears that to be another incident, so we are waiting confirmation. Uh, in addition, overnight, the occupiers once again launched drones towards the ports of Odessa. As of the time of creating this video, there haven't been reports of any hits or impacts. Meanwhile, in the Kupensk direction, the situation has stabilized and Russian attacks in the vicinity of Yagidne were unsuccessful. The village, which was previously in the gray zone, is now primarily experiencing shelling. Furthermore, the Ukrainian forces have shared a video online showing a Ukrainian drone capturing footage of an enemy group waving a white flag, indicating their readiness to surrender. So it seems that another batch of Russian troops is unable to withstand the pressure from the Ukrainian forces, though it's still unclear in which direction this occurred. In the Svatova area, the occupiers have also faced setbacks with Novoyegorovka and Novoselyevska remaining under the control of the Ukrainian forces as they were before. Uh, there have been no reported successes for the Russians. As a result, today there are only minimal shelling incidents and the situation can be considered stable. In the direction of Krimina and Siversk, uh, the occupiers continue shelling, but haven't initiated any offensive actions. The front line remains unchanged. Also, today the chief of the Norwegian Armed Forces stated. President Putin knows very well that NATO is not a threat against Russia. He says that, but he knows that, that we are not threatening Russia. Neither Norway, nor Sweden, or Finland, or Poland, we are not threatening Russia. If he believed that we were threatening Russia, he couldn't have moved all his troops to Ukraine to fight the war there. So on, a, on our border, on the Norwegian border, there is maybe 20% or less forces left than it used to be before uh, 24th of February 2022. So, th so he has taken that risk because he knows that NATO is not threatening anyone. It's clear that NATO has no intentions of launching an armed attack on Russia or any other country, despite Putin's daily claims to the contrary. 
The statement also directly implies that Russia has deployed virtually everything it can to Ukraine, suggesting that the world's second largest army lacks the strength to confront Ukraine alone, a country without navy, aviation, long-range missiles, so and even tanks. Allies have supplied Ukraine with just over 300 tanks, while the Russians have gathered over 500 tanks on just one front in Lugansk. They hope them to prevent the Ukrainian forces from liberating the occupied territory, but they still can't make advances. Also, I know everyone is interested in the situation with Katyrov today. I deliberately refrained from providing any information because it seemed more, the, more like a fake than the truth. However, today more and more confirmations are emerging that Kadyrov is indeed in the hospital, but his real condition is still unknown. One by one, expensive cars with state license plates from Chechnya or from other regions with Chen residents in the cabin arrive at the main Kremlin hospital. Moreover, their security details are allowed inside without inspection by the hospital security. Meanwhile, all other incoming vehicles are thoroughly inspected, even the vehicles underside. Uh, just an hour before arriving at the central clinic hospital, the Chan vehicles, including a Maybach with two security vehicles, a Porsche Cayenne, four G wagons, and many other expensive cars all showed up. However, in the morning, he posted a video from Grozny. But as you can understand, it was most likely a previously unpublished video deliberately released to divert attention from the fact that he's in the hospital. Overall, we are waiting for official confirmation, but it seems that Kadyrov may follow in the footsteps of Prigozhin. Maybe. And that's all from me. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye.